welcome to the Animal Training Academy Making Ripples podcast show, the show where we share the stories of the ripple-making extraordinaires with behavior nerd superpowers who make up the Animal Training Academy membership. I'm your host and one of the happiness engineers at Animal Training Academy, Shelley Wood from Drop Your Jaws Dog Training in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the United States. We are absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. This show is brought to you on behalf of the Animal Training Academy membership. So if you like the conversations in these episodes, then we want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people in the ATA membership, which you can find out more about at www.atamember.com. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help you problem solve your training challenges. And we are a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forums area. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Today, I'm excited to welcome Katie Bartlett to the show. A lifelong horse person, Katie was introduced to training with positive reinforcement in 1999 and has studied extensively with Alexandra Kurland and Kay Lawrence. Her website, www.equineclickertraining.com, is one of the oldest sites that shares information about teaching horses using positive reinforcement. The site contains descriptions of the work she has done with her own horses, as well as material from clinics and conferences she has attended. Her primary interest in using positive reinforcement, body work, and gymnastic exercises to improve the way horses move and feel about their training. She offers in-person and virtual coaching, as well as hands-on body work sessions. She is also the author of two books, Teaching Horses with Positive Reinforcement and What Can I Teach My Horse. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Shelley. It's very exciting to be here. I'm always so happy to get to talk to someone about training. Yeah, same here. It's always fun to talk to folks about training, and I am excited and happy to have you here with us today. Could you go ahead and start us out by telling us a little bit about how you started working with animals? I Just reading your bio, um, it really struck me, uh, introduced to training with positive reinforcement in 1999. Um, That seems like quite a long time to be working with positive reinforcement in horses. And also, I don't know a lot about the horse training world, but it seems like that might be kind of an early introduction to positive reinforcement in the horse training world. So I'd love to hear about some of your um, early experiences and what got you involved in positive reinforcement with tra- with horses at that time. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it was early. I mean, when I started training, there were two books out. There was Alex Curlin's book and Shauna Karish's book. And the internet was um, in its infancy, shall we say. So there wasn't a lot of information. And I actually found it sort of by accident. I'd never heard of clicker training. I, um, well, I, I should back up a little and say that um, I grew up with animals. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts. My parents were not horsey, but we had cats and dogs. And oh, at one point we had rabbits and goats and we lived on about six acres. And I always loved animals as a child, but I particularly loved horses. And as I got to be a teenager, I did more and more with horses. I didn't always have my own, but I had a lot of borrowed horses or rode other people's horses. Or I was the kid on the bicycle who would, you know, go and feed your horses dinner or take care of them if you went on vacation. So Um, I got exposed to a lot of different horse training, and I had a lot of friends who were more serious riders and competitors, and I would go along with them um, and groom at horse shows and things. So so I had a pretty animal-oriented childhood. And when I went to college, I studied biology because I was interested in animals, and I was also just interested in um, nature and science and things like that. And I went to Cornell and got my biology degree. And um, it's funny because when I was at Cornell, I, I mean, I had animals and I, I'm sure I was training them, but I wasn't aware that I was training them, you know, because I was just someone who'd always been around animals. And I, 
I guess I was aware of horse training and I did have a dog and I did a little training with her, but mostly I was with them doing things with them. And when I went to Cornell, I um, I didn't actually go as pre-vet or pre-med or anything. I was more interested in uh, nature and ecology and evolution and those kinds of things. To be honest, I um, my parents were very limiting in what we watched as TV as children. And we watched a lot of nature programs. And I was one of those kids who was fascinated by the people who like dressed up and went out and sat in the savannah and watched baboons for months on end and, you know, really learned what the species were doing in the wild. I was just fascinated by how animals were in their own environment and what we could learn about them. So I think when I went to Cornell, I knew I liked biology and maybe I had this vision of being an academic researcher or something like that. Um, But by the time I was done, I got a job in a research lab and I actually ended up doing more the computer end of things, which was, I think, really a function of the time. So when I um, was an undergraduate, I did a lot of work in research labs and it was just when computers were coming into labs. So apples were just coming out. I mean, before that, people had had computers, but they had been big mainframes or something else. And now all of a sudden you could have a personal computer in your lab. I was working in a research lab and they got a computer and they were all excited about using it, but nobody actually wanted to learn to use the computer because they didn't know how. So they would get, the professors would either get the graduate students or the lowly undergraduates to figure out how to use the darn thing so that they could, um, you know, use it to keep data and collect information on their research. And when I got out of school, I got a job in a research lab. They were actually studying hepatitis and woodchucks, but I was the computer person. And um, I did that for a year and then I got married and moved to Pennsylvania and I had a similar job where I worked in a computer lab. And I I started to get the feeling that maybe academia wasn't where I really wanted to be. So I started looking for other things. I worked on a horse farm. I eventually ended up working at a computer company. And um, I had animals all through this. I had still had horses and I had a dog. And then um, I got married and started having children. And I worked for about a year after I had my second child and then I stopped working and I was just at home. But I was I I was still playing with the horses and we had a lot of cats and I was very involved in I mean, children, to be honest, if you're interested in studying behavior, children are fascinating. Right. It's all the same thing. And um, at some point I bought a new horse and she's really the one who started me on the whole being an animal trainer thing. So I had. um a number of horses as the kids were little. And then I decided I wanted to buy a nice horse. So I was working with a trainer and she found me a nine month old warm blood mare that could be a dressage horse, which is what I was interested in. And because I uh, was home with kids and I didn't have a lot of ability to travel, I might even have been pregnant at the time. I let her pick the horse for me. She was going on a buying trip. So she found a nine month old filly And I saw her video and I liked her and, you know, I was told she would be able to do dressage. And so I bought her and she actually came from Holland. And when she arrived at my place, I was all excited. This was my dream horse. This was like going to be the horse I was going to do a lot with. When she arrived at my place, she was a little, um, I remember her getting off the van and she sort of had road buzz, you know, like she was just sort of not really present. And I took her up and I put her in the barn and we gave her hay and we watched her and stuff. And the next day I went out to see her and she literally threw herself against the wall of the stall with her teeth back and her with her ears back and her teeth bared. And she was like very, very aggressive. Um, She did not want anyone anywhere near her. And I, you know, I don't know what happened. I can only guess that she was a sensitive horse and she was young and she was probably traumatized by, she basically was shipped, flown, and then shipped again. And she got to my place and she was just like, I don't want anything to do with you. So um, I was pretty heartbroken because this was, you know, supposed to be my special horse. Anyways, um, I had worked with a lot of difficult horses. And it's funny, when we talked earlier, I said, I think... Maybe this happens in other um, areas, but I think with horse training, what happens is you're a little kid and you you want to ride. So you go and you spend time at a barn and you learn to ride horses. And as you get more skilled, they give you horses that are a little more difficult or have less training. And they tell you how to work with them or they just expect you to ride them. And over time, you sort of figure out how to ride more and more difficult horses. But there's, there's not usually, unless you become a 
professional or get a job, there's not usually a point at which someone says, now you are a horse trainer as opposed to just an owner or a rider. So I was still really in the mentality of I'm just a horse owner, you know, and I'm fairly educated and I had had some help along the way. But I didn't think of myself as a horse trainer. And so I was, you know, I had someone else pick the horse and I was relying on other people for help. But the woman who found the mare for me then moved. So I was at my farm. I keep my horses at home. I was at my farm with this really difficult young horse and I didn't have any help. And so I I did the best I could for about a year. And then I, I stumbled across Alex's book totally by accident. I'd never heard of clicker training. Um, I just, and it's a funny story because I, there's a big horse show near me called the Devon Horse Show. And it runs for like a week in the spring and a week in the fall. And they have like a shopping area attached to it. You know, vendors come and set up little stalls. And one of them was a horse bookstore. So the horse bookstore would come, I mean, talk about for a horse person, like a whole bookstore that was just horse books. I would go in there and buy like a year's worth of reading material. It was the highlight of my spring. I could go to the horse bookstore because this was before the internet, like before you could go online and buy specific things. So I was in the horse bookstore and I, I bought a number of books and I got a, I bought enough books that I got a bonus book. And I thought, what should I get for my bonus book? And I had picked up and put down Alex's book, um, thinking it looked interesting, but I wasn't sure. And I was trying to not buy too many books. So I bought it as my bonus book. And I, one of the reasons I was intrigued by it was because I didn't want to keep a horse that I didn't like. I, I didn't. I didn't feel like my relationship with Rosie, Rosie is the horse, was very good. We'd gotten so we were sort of safe around each other and I could get things done. But we, um, I don't think we really liked each other. And I, I thought, I can't keep a horse that I don't like. And Alex's book had tricks on the front of it. And it just looked like it might be a way to do some things with her before I started riding her or just some way to build some kind of a relationship with her. And I, in a way, I was like the perfect candidate for clicker training because I was already teaching horses tricks. I had a thoroughbred gelding named Willie who I had taught a lot of tricks to, and I was using food already. So I didn't have some of the big hangups that people have about switching to positive reinforcement. <clears throat> and I was really interested in behavior and learning. So I bought the book. I actually did not read it for six months. I, I still kick myself for that. But I, I had um, my youngest son in the fall and I had a lot of, when he was a newborn, I had a lot of time sitting with him. And so I read the book and I thought, can this really work? Like, is it possible you could train behavior this way? So I went out to the barn. I actually started with Willie and I taught him to touch a ball and then I taught him to push the ball. And then I thought, wow, this stuff is amazing. So then I started doing it with Rosie. And that was really how I got into it was, you know, in a weird way, it was such a chance encounter at that bookstore. And it was just the timing was so perfect because I had a difficult horse. I was already using food. I had time to experiment because I was home with my kids. And so I... um. I did it for about a year and Alex had her contact information in the back of the book. So I contacted her and she put me in touch. She told me about the existence of a Yahoo list. This is like so long ago that there was a Yahoo list for people who were interested in clicker training. So I joined that and that was the click writer list. And so this was in, um, my son was born in 1999. So this was in 2000. So um, there was the click writer list and there were lots of people who were, you know, just really excited about doing this new work. I mean, it was an amazing community. And then I started going to clinics with Alex and I just, oh, uh, I read everything I could get my hands on. I was so fascinated. I trained the dogs, the cats, the children, the guinea pigs, um, anything I, anything I could. And it's been really amazing actually to sort of see how everything has changed over the last 20 years. So like, When I started, information was so scarce, and now there's so many resources. There's almost too many. Like, how do you sort through them and figure out what to do? But um, yeah, that's how I got started. And it's funny because um, at some point in the last couple of years, I thought, wow, you know, I really, maybe someone asked me, like, I studied biology and I really don't do it. And I thought, you know, in a weird way, I've come back to it because what do I do? I spend my time observing horses and thinking about how they learn. And I definitely use like my science skills of studying and observing and collecting data and analyzing. And 
And having sort of an analytical brain has helped me to work through a lot of issues, you know, with horses or think about different ways to do things. And it's certainly helped me like if I, um, I think one of the things I feel like I've been able to contribute is I've taken notes at conferences and then um, written them up in a way that is more accessible to some people um, because I have the science background, but I also, you know, work in the field as a lay person. So, um, yeah, so that's how I ended up. And, you know, I still, it's funny, I hear about imposter syndrome all the time. And I guess maybe I have some dose of that. And then I still feel like there's so much we don't know. You know, there's so much we don't know about how animals learn. And there's, it's so, you know, even if you read a book and you know the theory, then when you go out and you try and do it, it never goes exactly the way they say it's going to go. There's always some little variation or some little quirk. And, you know, I think, we maybe I sometimes I think maybe it's healthy healthy that we all have imposter syndrome like better to be that way than to be the person who thinks they know everything and is so set in their mindset that they you know say it has to be done this way because um I, one thing I've learned about horses is as soon as you you know they keep you humble as soon as you think you figured out how to do something you go out the next day and there's some new little variation and you go okay, I didn't see that coming. Let's see what we can, you know, adjust from there. Anyways, that's kind of a long story, but um, I, I think it's interesting how, you know, we do always end up coming to places in sort of unexpected ways. And I think, you know, in a way I was interested in biology. I still am. I've just sort of discovered a new aspect of it. So it's a great story. Um, what an interesting journey you have been on that has led you where you are today. And I absolutely love what you just said about imposter syndrome, you know, and how maybe it's a good thing that we don't, that we acknowledge that we don't know everything and made me think of um, Sarah Owings and her um, brave learning, right. you know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and maybe that's a way to reframe imposter syndrome, you know, to think about ourselves as brave learners. Of course, we don't know everything. Um, nobody knows everything. There's so much for everybody to learn still. So I love that. Um, and I also love that you bought Alexandra Curlin's book as a, quote, bonus book. Yeah, I got I got it for free. It was my bonus book. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. And then awesome. I didn't read it for six months. Oh, my God. You know? <laughs> well, I think, of, you know, the word bonus to me just has this connotation of um, something extra, something good, you know, some mm -hmm. unexpected kind of surprise. And it sounds like that's exactly what it turned out to be. So, yeah, yeah. Very beautiful, beautiful story. I wonder, do you remember you said that you... You said a couple of things about your kids, um, not about your kids specifically necessarily, but about children. You said something about the um, uh, children being very interesting creatures to observe, um, lots of interesting behavior going on with children. And then you also mentioned that when you learned about positive reinforcement training and you started trying it on everyone, you were trying it on the horses, the guinea pigs, and, and you said your children as well. I wonder if you can think of any specifics um, that you might have, any specific kind of learning or teaching experiences back at that time that you might have had with your children based on what you were learning? Um, yeah, I mean, there's an obvious story that comes to mind, which is with my son. I, I have to say that, you know, this was in 2000, 2001, 2002, when, um, so when I was introduced to clicker training, it was all about consequences. Basically, you reinforce behavior, you're like, I don't think I even had antecedents on my brain until I met Susan Friedman. You know, I mean, I at, at some level, but when I, I took LLA with Susan and when I was first introduced to Susan, it was sort of this whole um, mind blowing thing of like, oh, we can influence it from both ends, you know, and I, I had certainly been using antecedents. So I think I think the reason I bring this up is I think my um, attempts to work with my children with positive reinforcement would have been better if I had understood about antecedents as it was. I only worked with consequences. So my favorite story is actually my oldest son's job was to um, set the dinner table. And his, uh, our house is set up so that his bedroom was directly over the area where the table was. So we don't have a dining room, but we have a, like a family room with a table on one end. 
And I would be cooking dinner and to get him to set the table, I would have to go upstairs and get him to come down to do it, which when you're in the middle of cooking dinner is somewhat inconvenient and it starts to seem like it would be easier to just set the table yourself. Um, so I, and I, we weren't completely regular about dinner hours. So I should preface this by saying I have five children. So my house was mostly chaotic most of the time. So I suggested to him that if I tapped on the ceiling of the, over the table, it would be in his, he, it would be his floor of his room and he could hear that. And it would mean he should come down and set the table. And he was very resistant to the idea Uh, there. I don't know if he just thought it was. He just didn't like the idea that I could summon him in that way, okay? I don't remember how old he was. He was probably, um, oh God, I can't do the math in my head right now. But anyways, he was of an age where like having your mother tell you what to do to your face was bad enough. And to have her like have some little thing she did that made you jump and get up and move was not what he wanted. So he's pretty resistant about it. And um, I said, wouldn't it be simpler? You know, you could hear it and then you could come down. And he was resistant to the idea of it. And I, I said, all right, well, I think I was already paying him for setting the table. So I, I upped his, I said, if you come down within a certain amount of time of hearing the tap, you'll get paid more. And that he, 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 he's an interesting child. He verbally resisted that, but it was actually effective. So he said, I, w- I won't do that. I'll just come when I feel like it. But if I paid, you know, for the times when I paid him more, his latency definitely um, changed. So um, I felt like that was pretty successful. And then I did have sort of this dilemma of how to wean him down to a level of reinforcement that was appropriate for me. So I, I was experimenting with sort of variable. I had, I had it on, you know, um, differential reinforcement in that if you were faster, you got more money. And then over time, I sort of shifted it. I, one day I said, well, wouldn't it be simpler if I paid you every week instead of every day? And that sort of separated out like the immediate reinforcement enforcement from the coming right down. And then I was able to tinker with how much, and I, it's a little fuzzy, the memories, but what I remember most out of that was how resistant he was to the idea of it first and how effective it was in the long run. I mean, in the long run, I didn't pay him at all. I would just tap and he would come downstairs. So that was one of my, I had a lot of sort of um, failures with things. And, and again, I think some of it had to do with, um, like I wanted the kids to, um, Kids, at least my kids, had a tendency to come home from school and come in the back door and just sort of shed all their belongings. So in the back hall, I would come in and there would be backpacks and coats and shoes and stuff all over the place. And the places to put them weren't that far away. They had to walk three steps and put their shoes over here. So I I did experiment with trying to um, pay them for or reinforce them in some way for like putting their shoes over on the shoe rack. And the only one that actually worked on was the child who was fairly neat to start with. Um, And that's one of those things I sometimes think about now, like if I was going to do it over again, I think I would have put a box right in front of the door. So like as soon as you came in, here was the shoe box. And then like a week later, moved it six inches to the, you know, I would have been smarter about how I trained it. But um, yeah, I mean, I had, a, as a mother, it was um, interesting, you know, instead of just dealing with all the daily stuff, it was interesting to try and think of ways to improve things and, and get people to um, behave in ways that you liked. I, the other thing I also learned a little bit from it, I don't know if this is sad or if this is just life, is I had various conversations with them about, are there things that you do that you know I like you do? Like if you wanted to do something nice or helpful, what would you do? And they really had no concept of that. So I, I made a little effort to sort of say to them, you know, these are things that I appreciate because they were just sort of in their own little worlds doing their own little things. But um, yeah, so that was my, uh, the the calling for dinner was definitely my biggest success. And I, you know, like I said, I, I trained the dogs and the um, I, I did a lot of cat training back then. I had a couple cats I trained a lot and they really enjoyed it. I, I did learn um, with one cat that the last thing you want to teach a cat to do is have its first trick be to lie down because that was all he ever wanted to do. <laughs> so I was like, teach a, teach a more active trick first. Um, and I had guinea pigs. I, I trained them to go through tunnels and do little agility courses. And I have an old guinea pig video that's probably still floating around on YouTube. Um, yeah, I just, I, it was so fascinating to me. I, I wanted to train everything I could and, you know, I was at home with the kids, so I couldn't like go out and suddenly start working in the field or doing anything like that. So I just trained everything I could think of. (laughs) 
Anyways, thank you so much for sharing some of those stories yeah. with us. Um, what about Rosie? How did your relationship change or did your relationship change with Rosie? Did you come to like her and do you feel like she came to like you? Yeah, Rosie. Rosie's interesting. I mean, it, it's funny. Um, so Rosie's uh, 24 now and uh, she's had a lot of health issues in the last couple of years. And so she's been a little sad, but she's still herself. So Rosie um, was a challenge on so many levels. I mean, I I would say within a few years, I got to the, you know, and people, I, I think clicker training is funny. There are some things where you can clicker train and get a change really quickly. And it's just mind blowing. But there are some things I think that just take time. And so early when I used to talk about Rosie, people always wanted to hear the, oh, she was instantly transformed story. And I was like, no, it took years Years and years of slow and steady work, of just reinforcing her for doing things I liked, of learning to understand and read her better, of being consistent. She's a horse who, one of the things I learned with her is, <clears throat> I think she's a fairly sensitive horse and she really hates not knowing what to do. I'm anthropomorphizing a little bit, but if you put her in a situation she doesn't know what to do, she gets cranky, she gets defensive. So I had to really learn to be consistent and it takes a while to build routines and um, come up with ways of being like that. And so it took, I mean, I don't know at what point I would say that we got a really good relationship, but um, I certainly learned to like her. She's, I used, I sometimes refer to her as the fabulous Miss Rosie. She just became this amazing sort of border collie of a horse. She, she was an eager learner. She was enthusiastic about things. She was difficult to ride because she was so um, sensitive to changes in the environment. Like I don't have an indoor riding space. I ride outdoors. And I think one of the challenges of working with horses is we often can't control our environment as much as we would like because we're outside, there's weather, there's people going by, there's airplanes, there's any number of things. So she was um, difficult that way, but I, I got her to the point, my goal with her had been to do some dressage and I did get her to the point where I could take her off the farm and ride in lessons and clinics and she was very well behaved for me. Um, she even got to the point, uh, you know, five years ago, I was still taking her places and I could take her to a barn for a clinic, for a weekend clinic, and people could handle her and go in and out of her stall. And as long as they didn't mess with her, she was fine. She she was always very reactive to hands coming towards her. So if you walked up to her and you tried to pat her, she would kind of pin her ears at you. Not me, but other people. But if you just stood and did nothing, she would sniff you and smell you. She was just worried about if you reached towards her, what you might do. So, yeah, we have a great relationship. I mean, I I, I can't say that like she doesn't still frustrate me sometimes because she's just, she's just who she is and you have to be mindful around her. But um, it's funny, my vet was here the other day drawing blood work and she had a new vet tech with her. And she, I, I thought this was slightly unkind, but she introduced Rosie and she said, oh, this is the difficult mare I told you about. She goes, but she's really good with her owner. And as long as your owner are there, is there, she'll be fine. And I thought, well, at least I have that. Um, but she's really a very personable horse. She's just a little protective of her personal space and she's worried about things in the environment and she doesn't like surprises. And so um, I, there's really, you know, handling her around the farm and things like that. She she really got very easy for me to do most things with. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, it, I I wouldn't have... I wouldn't have been able to keep her if I hadn't found clicker training, honestly. I, I don't think I would have. I think I would have at some point gone. I, I can't have a horse that is so, you know, we put a lot of time and energy into your horses and to have you have it be that every time you walk up to the horse, it pins its ears at you. It's just not, it makes it not worth it anymore. And I, I was actually surprised when she was young, the number of people who said to me, oh, it doesn't matter that she'll be difficult on the ground because she'll be such a fabulous horse to ride. And I was like, that didn't make any sense to me. I mean, we don't have horses just to ride them. We have horses because we like interacting with them. And um, and she's funny. She's the biggest talker in my barn. Like if I come out to the barn and she wants something, she nickers at me and she gives me her cute face and she wants to interact with people all the time. So it's not that she hates people. She just, I don't know, she got off on the wrong foot somehow. I actually, um, I bred her when she was four and she had a foal. 
And um, he gave me some insight into her personality, assuming that he took after her a little bit in that he was very friendly and good natured, but he was incredibly sensitive. And I thought that's what she was like. And she just went through a traumatic event and it just, it it made her um, a little suspicious. I don't know. Do you remember um, the Peanuts cartoons? Did you ever read Peanuts? Okay. So there's the, the Lucy is crabby. That was how I used to think about Rosie, but she's not really anymore, at least not to me. So uh, she's always eager to do stuff. Well, I'm super glad for both of you that you got the bonus that you did um, to help you two with your relationship. And I know we're going to dive in a little bit deeper to some specific training questions in just a minute here. But before we do that, um, could you kind of tell folks what you're up to training related now, Um, maybe with your own horses, but also um, uh, resources that you might have available for others? Like your oh, yeah. writings and... Yeah. So um, I have, I mean, in 2003, I started the website equineclickertraining.com. Um, I really started it because Alex was looking for, uh, we were putting together websites of people who were working with Alex and I offered to host a list of um, clicker trainers so that people could network and find each other. And I I had the computer background and I was interested in doing something and I was at home. So I, I thought, oh, I'll write a website. So that website still exists. Um, but now when you go to it, it links you to the other website, which is equineclickertraining.wordpress.com, which is where all of the articles now live. I had, for logistical reasons, I had to transfer stuff over, but you can use either one. So it's either equineclickertraining.com or equineclickertraining.wordpress.com. And um, there's lots of training stories, there's conference notes, there's all kinds of things on there. And I I use that sort of for longer things. I have a Facebook page, which is equine clicker training dash Katie Bartlett. And I started that, gosh, I don't know how, but early on in Facebook days. And I used to post um, little things. I, I don't know if you remember this, but when Facebook face first came out, it had a... Um, word limit. So you could only, in the little comments, in the little post box, you could only put, I don't know, 40 or 60 words. I can't remember how many it was, but I remember trying to like, I tend to be sort of um, wordy when I write. And I remember thinking, oh, this is a good challenge for me to like try and say something meaningful in just a few words. Um, Anyways, so I have the Facebook page. I have to confess that this year I have not been very active on the Facebook page or um, on my WordPress page for a number of different reasons. And I'm, I'm hoping in the fall to have more time to do writing, but I, there's lots of stuff up there to read. And I had a couple of big projects. I did the alphabet blog in the last two years, which was um, one of those ideas I had in the middle of winter when you feel like you have free time. I thought it would be fun to write a series of blog posts that were to give people ideas for things to do. And I did it with an alphabet theme. So I have one that's, you know, it's called What Can I Train? And it says A is for, and there's like 10 behaviors that start with A that you could train. And my idea was just to give people ideas and maybe some tips on different things. Because I meet a lot of people who use clicker training with horses, but they're very narrow in their view of what you can do with clicker training, or they just aren't very creative. So I was hoping it would give people ideas. They would say, ah, I don't know what to do. And they could go and, you know, look through the blogs and get ideas. And if I found resources of like how to actually train it, I would include that. But it wasn't really meant to be a how-to as much as it was meant to be a, um, you know, just a place for, for inspiration or ideas or to look at pictures and things. So that was a big project. It took me about two years. And when I was done with that, I was a little bit, um, I wouldn't say burned out, but I needed a break before I decided what to do next. And then summer came. And so I haven't been writing that much, but you can find those. The alphabet blogs are um, on the WordPress site and you can even get them as a Kindle book if you want to have them as a whole book. So that's what the the second book, What Can I Teach My Horses, the Kindle version of the blogs. Um, so that's what I have for resources. And you can always contact me. Um, I have a few projects in mind for maybe next winter, but I haven't really decided what I'll do next. Um, Okay. And then your other question was my, what am I doing? (laughs) Uh, Well, I'm mostly working with my own horses right now. Um, I have, at one point we had eight horses here, but sadly we've lost a few. And so we currently have five horses at home. And even just taking care of them has become more time consuming because as they've gotten older, they've uh, have some health issues and they have 
um, I've had to change the way they live, which has become more labor intensive. But I still go out and train every day. And I have two horses I work with regularly. One is um, Aurora, who I'll talk about more. Uh, she's an eight-year-old Oldenburg mare. I bought her in 2014. And then in 2020, I bought a Lusitano gelding. And um, he was, he technically is a crossover horse. He was started before I bought him. He was four. Um, and I introduced him to clicker training and I've sort of been bringing him along. They, um, they both have some physical challenges. Aurora had an, I bought Aurora as a eight or nine month old foal. And a month after she came, she decided to jump over my water trough and she got stuck in it. And um, she actually had like three legs hooked up over the edge and only one foot in the trough and she couldn't get out. And so it took me a little while to figure out how to get her out. And she has, I don't, I've had vets look at her and nobody's actually identified specific damage, but she clearly damaged her sternum and her pelvis a little because she was hung up on it. So, um, and then the horse Madagascar, who I bought, I, I bought him sort of as a project horse. I knew he had some physical issues. So to be honest, the last couple of years, I still do all the training I do, but I've really delved into physical rehab for horses because it's something they both needed. And and with horses, especially because so often we want to ride or do things with them, I think it's really important to make sure that you're looking out for the body as well as the brain, because, you know, you can't ask a horse, you can't train a horse to do something if they physically can't do it or if it's uncomfortable to them. So, um, so I, I work with them most days and they're both being ridden a little bit and I have some uh, exercises and some body work and I'm just trying to learn more about how to help them um, be comfortable in their bodies and still get out and do some interesting things with me. Um, I guess I'm a believer that um, horses like to get out and do things and they enjoy our sessions. And so I'm always trying to come up with um, groundwork ideas or little riding patterns or things that they can do. And and they're coming along. But, you know, it's a with Rosie, I was after sort of high level dressage performance. So it's kind of a different a different route for me to be really looking at, OK, what are the simple things you can do today? Um, what are the things I can do to help you learn to be able to do more and um, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm doing. I mean, hopefully in the fall, I'll get back to some writing. And, and sometimes I do some teaching and coaching, kind of depends on how much demand there is for it. Um, in all honesty, since there's so much online resources, I if somebody wants like a whole program, I tend to steer them towards someone else because I think it makes more sense for them to like be able to follow someone's prescribed system for going through it and have other students to work with along the way. Um, but I do individual coaching, you know, if someone has a specific problem. Um, I like working with people. Well, thank you so. very much for catching us up on all of that and um, what you're working on today and also where folks can go to read some of your writings and, and those kinds of things. And we will definitely link to all of that in the in the show notes for people, too. And we'll be on the lookout this fall for some yeah, new... Yeah, we'll see if I can do something. I have yeah. a few things in mind, but I just have to decide how to do it. It seems like for me, fall and winter is always a good time to kind of delve into projects like that that keep you indoors a little bit more. So I'll be excited to, to see what you land on, what you come up with this fall. Let's dig into some specific training situations now. I'm hoping that you could share with us about a training-related challenge, um, something that you've either worked through or are working through, and kind of share with us some of the things that you learned from that challenge. Okay. Um, well, I had sort of thought I would talk about Aurora's, what I think of as Aurora's bad year, <laughs> just a terrible maybe way to say it, but she did have a bad year. So, um, you know, in general, I think, you know, most of us wouldn't stick with training if we didn't occasionally have training challenges, it would get boring. So there's always little things that happen where, you know, you want to train something new and you don't know how to train it, or you've trained something the same way a number of times. And then you try that with a new horse and that horse gives you something totally different. And you're like, okay, I have to rethink this. So I, I like all those little kinds of challenges, but the, the, the big training challenge with Aurora was totally unexpected. And really, um, I think I had the skills to deal with it, but it was really beyond the scope of what I've dealt with before. And 
what happened was, um, so I have to give a little background and, and I, um, I'll try not to get too deep into it. So I bought Aurora in 2014. Uh, she was nine months old and I brought her home and I, um, the challenge with buying horses is then you have to sort of somehow get them into a turnout situation and get them acclimated to introduce to your, to your herd of horses. So it took me a little while to do that, but I got her so she would go out with two geldings and they had a big field and everything was really nice. And they lived together for about five years. And then um, in 2019, one of the geldings uh, had an injury in the pasture. He, he hurt his leg and I had to bring him in and do stall rest in small paddocks. So she was still out with um, the, the big horses, but she would get one horse, but the other horse was gone. And I had you know, in that five years, I had done a lot of training with her. We had done groundwork. I'd started riding her a little bit. She was coming along pretty well. I was starting to get a sense that there were going to be physical challenges I had to deal with at some point. But I was, you know, just in starting green horse mode. So in 2019, Red hurt his leg. And, and so she was separated from one of her friends. Now he, um, my horses are not out 24 seven, they're in stalls half the time. And so she was next to him in the barn. So he was still there, but he wasn't out in the field. And then um, in the summer of 2020, her other friend um, got really sick and had to go to the horse hospital. And he was gone for a week. And I couldn't put her out in the big field alone. So I moved her down and put her in the small paddock by the barn, which she was fine with. And actually, she was kind of fat. So it was good to get her off the field. So she was down there for a week. And then finale, her friend came home. And I thought, oh, it'll be nice to put them back out together. So I put them out and he, he chased her. He actually, he's a Shire and she's an Oldenburg. He's not fast, which is good in this situation. He chased her around the field and she was actually like screaming. I, I've never heard a, heard a horse scream like, like, like she was terrified. And these horses had lived together for five years. And all I can think of is either he smelled like the hospital or I, I don't I don't know what happened. Anyways, I separated them. I took her down to the barn. I scratched my head. I went up and I put some hay in the field. Um, this was in the spring and I usually don't put hay out because they eat grass. But I thought, well, if they have the distraction of the hay. I put her back out and they were fine. And then about three days later, the same thing happened. And so I thought, uh, I'm not putting her out with him. I'd already had a horse with a pasture injury. So she had to live alone in the barn. And then um, that summer red had to be put down. So she lost all her friends. And I, the reason I think this is relevant is in the fall of 2020, I bought Madagascar. So he was the new horse. And he came in October and I, um, uh, Aurora had been living in the, in the paddock by the barn. There's actually three stalls that open out into a big field. And I had a temporary fence line between to separate that field in half. So Rosie was on half and Aurora was on the other half. And I, um, <clears throat> I, that had worked pretty well, but I decided I wanted to put the new horse in, we have two barns. So I wanted to put him in the main barn because that's where the tax stall is and everything. So I moved her next to Rosie and I put Madagascar on the end. And he came at eight in the morning because um, he was shipped overnight from Florida. And they sniffed. They seemed fine. I didn't think anything of it. I went in the house. I came back out. And by the end of the day, I was sort of looking at her going, there's something odd because she was, instead of standing eating her hay, she was flattened against the stall next to Rosie. So he's on one end, Rosie's on the other end, she's in the middle. Instead of doing her thing in the middle stall, and she could go in and out of the barn too, she was flattened against the wall and she had cut her eye. And I thought, oh, that's really weird. And then I looked at her and I'm like, she's scared of him. So she was staying as far away from the new horse as she possibly could. So that was kind of weird, but I was like, all right. So I, I watched her for a little while and then I thought, I don't like this. So I took him and I moved him to the other barn. So I took him so he was no longer in sight. And I put him in the shed row barn, which has four stalls, which is next to it. I had an empty stall over there. And she settled down and she ate. And um, over the next few days, what I realized was I had to keep him completely out of her sight. If she could see him, she would panic. She would either run around in her field or she would spin around in her stall and she was actually cutting her head on the edge. And then one night or one day when I had her out, she actually went through the electric fence into the field where Rosie was to get away from him because he was turned out in the day behind the barn. It's a little hard without a picture, but you know, if you picture the barn is like this, she's turned out in a pasture to the, to the um, south side and the 
new horse was on the pasture on the east side. So they could see each other, but they weren't next to each other. There's actually a big laneway between. So she was worried enough. She broke through the fence and went in with Rosie. And um, I was trying to, I, I had, I mean, I've had trouble introducing horses, but nothing like this was sort of a whole level beyond what was normal for me. And what was really frustrating was it was like her home was over threshold now. You know, like we talk about carefully introducing changes and having them have a safe place. She didn't have a safe place anymore. So um, I guess at night when he was in the stall in the other barn and she was in her barn and field and he was out of sight, she felt okay. So I spent about a week sort of juggling things around and trying to assess how much trouble there was and sort of at the same time trying to keep her on some kind of a routine that was used to normal. Because I, I think horses like to have things done the way things are done. And I felt like the more I could stay normal and do the same things I did with her, take her into the wash stall and groom her, take her up to the ring and walk her around, take her out to the yard and hand grace, the better she would be. Because then I thought she would just get used to the idea of, okay, he's here, but my life has not changed. Everything is the same for me. So um, I did that for about two weeks. And actually, I sort of got to the point where um, she was not panicking anymore. She did a lot of, um, she was doing a lot of pacing along the fence line in the field in the beginning, but once she was in with Rosie, she didn't have as much trouble. And I wasn't sure what to do about that because I didn't, I let her stay in with Rosie, but I wasn't crazy about it because, well, Rosie tends to sort of, um, tell the other horses what to do if she's turned out with someone, but also the setup was such that the field, so there's box stalls that open into this field, and that's where they can go to get away from the flies or something. And the problem with that kind of setup is if one horse is in the stall and the other horse wants to come in, and the horse who wants to come in is, um, I don't want to say dominant, but is in the habit of pushing the other one around, the one in the stall will get panicked because they have to get out to let the other one in. And you can have accidents happen. So I, I'm always careful with that kind of setup to only put <clears throat> horses together that really get along, that can go in the same stall together and not have a problem. So I, I didn't really love the setup. So what I ended up doing was I put the electric fence back up and I put R Aurora on the downhill side and Rosie on the uphill side. So now when she was turned out during the day, she really couldn't see Madagascar out in the back. And I was um, I was still trying to work with her every day and sort of assess like what's available to me, like what can she still do? Can she do targeting? Can I work with her in the stall? It was a little reluctant to work with her in the field because I I've tried to let their fields be sort of their own space and not a training space. Um, and I couldn't bring her into the main barn because I couldn't, I was really limited. She could only be in her stall or in um, the field away from it. But I, I managed to do a little bit with her and I actually got, so I felt like we were making progress and I wanted to be able to take her up to the ring. And I tried that. And if Madagascar was in the barn, she was okay. I still couldn't do all the things I'd been doing before he came, but I could... I could take her out and walk. <clears throat> My ring is rectangular and it's um, bordered by the field where Madagascar was being turned out. And so I could walk her on the uphill, the farthest side away from his field. I could walk up and down that and put out mats and cones and do little clicker training games there. And as long as she had the whole width of the arena between her and his field, she was okay. And this was if he was not in the field, but she was worried. I think she was just worried about the environment at this point. So, so this went on for about two weeks and I, um, I felt like I was making progress, but it, frankly, it was difficult to keep them totally separated. So I thought, what if I let him stay out during the day and I gave him hay, I could put hay like at the far side of his field. So like, you know, she's over here working in the ring and he's as far away. I was trying to think of like a transition to get between them. So um, I did that and she regressed a little so I could do fewer things walking in the ring. And I, this is one of those times where um, the fact that she was clicker trained was really, really useful information for me because I had a lot of information I could get from her. Like I knew she was nervous, but I had things I could use like if she wouldn't stop for the click, I knew she was more nervous than if she did stop for the click. 
if she stopped for the click but wouldn't wait for me to deliver the food, that was like another distinction. Like, okay, she stops for the click, but I can't actually walk up to her head and feed her. If she'll stop for the click and I can walk up to her head and feed her, then I know she's better than if she walks off right after the click. Like I had all these little ways of evaluating, does she stop for the click? Does she wait for the food? How does she take the food? Does she leave immediately after she takes the food instead of waiting for me to ask her to walk off? I felt like I had a really good way of gauging what her mental state was. Whereas if I hadn't had that, I would have just been walking her and gone, well, maybe she can stand still, maybe she couldn't. And I could really meet her where she was. Like in the beginning, if she didn't stop for the click, then I didn't click her. We just walked back and forth and then we went into the barn. When she got so she would stop for the click, um, if she didn't want to wait for the food, that's fine. I used being able to move off as reinforcement for stopping for the click. If she got to the point where she would stop for the click and take a treat, but then she wanted to move off immediately, then I tried to be creative about asking for different things after she got the food so she didn't assume that we were going to go forward again. I mean, her thing is if she's nervous, she just walks really fast. Um, so I was I felt really lucky that I had this in my toolbox and I could use it as information about how to do it. So um, so I got I did get to the point where if he was eating hay, she could stay out there. And then um, I just kept, I mean, this could be a really long conversation. I mean, I basically just kept picking away at little things like initially I couldn't take her and put her in my grooming stall if he was turned out. So this is a horse in a field, the other side of a building with a laneway. And if she wouldn't go and stand in the grooming stall. And I learned that um, at this time I was working with him and then working with her. And I learned if I flipped the order, she was better. I think she smelled him in the grooming stall. So if I did her first, she was calmer. I changed um, some of the uh, way, like I learned, um, I changed her field. So she was downhill. I think maybe I already said that. I changed, I had been working her in a bitted bridle, which I had very carefully introduced to her the year before. And she had been fine in it, but I took her and I put her back in the bitless bridle because I could see that in the bitted bridle, she had more facial tension. She was, it made her anxious. And I also realized that any kind of work I did with her where I was right at her head, she tended to be more anxious. I think she felt, she's a horse that has never liked feeling restricted. So like she doesn't want a tight lead. She doesn't like to wear anything on her head. She doesn't want to fly a mask. She doesn't want to fly bonnet. She's just very, um, I, I don't want to say defensive. She's like the little kid who, does, who doesn't want to wear clothes. You know, the, things feel bad. So she wants to take everything off. So what I ended up doing eventually with her is I put her in long lines and I, do you know what long lines are? So um, long line is pretty standard practice to do for starting young horses or for training horses to drive. So instead of walking at the horse's head, you have two lines that go from whatever you have on their head, their halter or their bridle, and you walk behind them. And what I discovered, with, and I had done a lot of this with her, and it was an activity she enjoyed. We'd done a lot of, you know, I would walk behind her, we'd go to mats, or we'd go around cones, we'd do little patterns. And I realized that by walking behind her, I could still influence where she went, but she didn't feel so restricted by me because it wasn't like right up near her head. And, and also I then could be less reactive. So if she wanted to stop or if she wanted to turn, I wasn't like next to her where I had to worry about her coming into my space. I was behind her. So I did a lot of long lining with her and that was really how I got her to the point where I could use more of the ring. And there's a lot of other little steps and things I put in there, but I'll let you ask some questions. But I'll, I'll tell you the upshot of this is it took me a year, an entire year to get back to the point where I could ride her in the ring while he was turned out. And even then I was still a little careful because in the way this always is, what he likes to do when I ride her is come and stand by the fence and watch. And so once I knew where he was going to stand and he was standing still, I didn't have to worry about so much, but I had a lot of, I do a lot of um, arena patterns with her. And, you know, my arena pattern always included <clears throat> loop away from the wall here. So it was like he had a little force field around him and I would, you know, be coming around the corner and I would have to make a turn and loop around just so that I didn't pass the fence right near where he was standing. And I mean, it was, I still don't know why she had such a meltdown. I mean, the reason I shared this stuff about her friends is I think that probably contributed to it. I don't know if she was feeling vulnerable or if I've had some people say, well, maybe the horse who chased her was a dark horse and he's a dark horse. I mean, the other thing that's interesting about this whole thing was, um, 
And I had noticed this a little bit with Rosie, but horses use their sense of smell way more than I think we realize. So when she, when I had her in the ring and she would be worried about him, she would stop and she would like air scent like a dog. She would take her head up and smell him. And, and then she would decide maybe it was okay and maybe it wasn't. But that was definitely the most, I mean, that was the most challenging thing I've gone through because there was just so many layers of, um, and this was what I thought was basically a well-adjusted, clicker-trained, happy horse and everything just totally unraveled. But it's like there were enough pieces there that if I just kept sort of picking away at it, and trying to systematically go, okay, you can do this. Can you do the next thing? And I, I had a lot of days when I sort of went, maybe I should just like turn around and just leave her for a year and let her get used to it. But I, I didn't, I had this feeling that if I did that, she would just um, not adjust, you know? And I thought about like bo- taking him someplace else. I could get rid, I could take him and board him someplace else and just go, okay, this is not going to work. But um, in the end, you know, we worked through it, but it was a, it was a very slow process. Anyways, that was my, that was, I guess that was Katie's bad year too. Katie and Aurora's bad year. And, and how long you, I think you probably said this at the beginning, but when, when did you bring him in? How long ago was this? He came in the fall of 2020. So basically from 20, fall of 2020 into fall of 2021, um, I was working through this. And uh, I still don't think she particularly likes him, um, but they've sniffed noses a few times now. And I can certainly bring him in and out and um, she doesn't get upset by him. Um, and I, you know, it's a mystery to me why it was, why it was such a big deal. But it was, it was just, you know, with Rosie, I got really good at um, introducing changes gradually and not letting her get so upset that she couldn't listen to me. And I, the first month or two when he was here, there were days when like you could tell that like Aurora was just not a- available. Like she was so upset by whatever had changed that she wouldn't target, she wouldn't touch, she wouldn't interact. She was just not in any kind of state to learn or connect or do anything with someone. And that was really um, unusual for me. I mean, I, I usually you have some way you can get them back and, and find a familiar thing or, or connect with them. And it was so sad that it was in her own home environment. And she, she just couldn't, she couldn't do it. Um, but she's, like I said, she's, she's pretty good now. She's, I think there are remnants of it. She's still reactive to some things she would not have been reactive to in the past. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was Aurora's bad year. And um, hopefully, you know, hopefully we've turned the corner and she's been, <clears throat> she's been actually really good this this summer and I'm hoping that we'll continue that. Well, I really enjoyed hearing about all of the um, thought and planning that you put into that and uh, the, the respect that you had for Aurora and her feelings, you know. Um, you could, it's easy sometimes to just kind of think, uh, this is, uh, you just need to get over this sort right, of thing. Right. No, yeah. I, I had days when I wondered if I should, you know, if I was, you know, I feel like you're always sort of walking the fine line between helping them learn to cope and keep going versus doing too much and pushing them versus giving up and saying, I don't expect you to do anything anymore. And I, mm-hmm. I think for me, part of it was, <clears throat> her living situation was she was living in a small paddock down by the barn now. And I, I just didn't think it was good for her to just be there all the time. I felt like if I just let her be there all the time, she would just, A, it wasn't good movement and health wise because I wanted to be able to get her out and exercise a little. But also I felt like <clears throat> I, I have had animals where they you keep making their world smaller and smaller because they can't handle anything. And then their world just keeps getting smaller and smaller. So it was, um, I think the hardest thing for me really was I didn't, I didn't know what it was really about him or why. So I couldn't address it from that end. You know, I don't know if he just rubbed her the wrong way or who knows what he said to her like that first day. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. Well, anyway. I'm glad that her world is no longer getting smaller and smaller and hope yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, we're working on it. It's still yeah. smaller than it used to be, but I, you know, these days I can, um, take her up and do what I want in the ring. And actually this spring I built a a covered round pen, which is a little bit, it's actually the other side of his field and it's a new training space. And I was curious to see how she handled that because, um, well, so one of the challenges with working with her in the ring was after the incident with finale, where he chased her, I tried turning her out in some of our other horse fields, sometimes with other horses, because I wanted her to be able to have more space in her paddock. And she panicked anytime she was turned out away from the barn 
which is one reason why I didn't like trying to do liberty work or something with her in the ring when Madagascar was out as a way to connect with her because I thought she would just instantly um, panic and, and I didn't see how that was helpful. So I felt I needed a more structured approach, but I built the new building this spring. I didn't build it. Somebody else built it, but I was interested to see how she felt down there because it was a new area and she was a little nervous, but she's been really good. So I feel like it hasn't had a lasting effect as far as, you know, now I'm going to be phobic about any new environment. It was just something about him coming in. And, you know, I haven't had another horse come since then. So I don't know if she would do it with another horse. I feel a little nervous about having another horse come like I don't know. Yeah, I could see that feeling a little nervous yeah, about that. Yeah. Um, but super interesting situation. And um, I'll love to, I hope you'll keep us posted uh, maybe in the ATA community. Even yeah, I haven't, yeah, I haven't, her- I haven't written or shared much about it, partly because I, um, well, I, some of it was time and also it's, I mean, I, I feel like the same thing must sometimes happen with people who like introduce new dogs or cats to a household or stuff. But I, I've never had it happen with horses where, I mean, I wasn't trying to turn them out together. I just wanted them, you know, visually seeing each other. And, and um, I just hadn't encountered that with horses before. So, but yeah, I could definitely share some things. Um, maybe if they ever get to be friends. <laughs> yeah, that would be lovely yeah, if they got to be friends. But yeah. um but even if it doesn't go quite that far, which I hope it does, but even if it doesn't, I would love to hear how things continue to progress. Um, yeah. But for, while well, I could just keep asking questions and chatting about this situation for sure, for the sake of time, I would love to now hear, although I think that one could certainly fit the bill for this question too, um, but I would love to now hear about a training situation, something you've trained or a training situation that you've been in that either you're proud out of and or found reinforcing? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I mean, it's funny. Was that whole situation reinforcing? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just so relieved <laughs> to be through it. I, I think it was reinforcing when I had like little steps of progress along the way. Um, you know, my favorite, I, I have a story about, I mean, I have a particular behavior in mind, but I have to say that the thing I find most reinforcing, and sometimes this gets me in trouble, is I love it when animals figure something out and offer it for you. You know, especially if you have an animal that like has never offered behavior before. I love it when they're you're doing a training session and they suddenly go, is this it? I know how to do it. Like that just, it just makes you feel cool. Like learning, you actually seeing learning right in front of your eyes where the animal goes, you reinforce that. I thought about it. I'm going to do it again. Um, and I love that so much that sometimes I blow my stimulus control. But anyways, that's a, I think that's a challenge we all have because we like to see animals, you know, choose to do things and, and offer behaviors we know. And um, anyways, I thought, um, you know, it's funny. I'm glad I talked about Rosie because I don't want the whole podcast to be about Aurora. But the the thing that I have done in the last couple of years that's been the most reinforcing to me is um, I call it a game, but whatever you want to call it. It came out of this bad year that Aurora had, which is I, uh, like I said, I did the long lining and I was trying to come up with ways to get her moving without um, running or chasing her or any of those kinds of things. And I had done a lot of work with mats. So um, I teach horses to stand on mats. You can stand on them with your front feet and stand on them with your back feet, stand on them with all four feet. Your mat is big enough. And horses get so they really like mats. So a fun activity to do is, and sometimes you don't even have to train this deliberately. They'll start to anticipate is if you're walking along, the, you can send the horse ahead of you to the mat. So it's sort of like my husband calls them parking spaces. So you can um, send them out to a mat. And when I was working with Aurora um, in the long lines, I mixed in some days where I had her just on a single lunge line. And at the time I was doing this, um, I I guess I should point out that my outdoor riding space for up until last year had a lot of grass in it. So it had had a groomed area that had good arena footing, but it had grass on three sides and then it had a whole grassy hill on one side. So in the summer, especially if you have a horse that's restricted to grazing, it's pretty hard to do liberty work in there because it's just too tempting. They're, they just want to go graze. So I always have them on a line. And they they learned that when they're on a line, they're not allowed to go and eat grass. And sometimes with some of the horses I can let them eat either before or after the session or some sadly don't get to. Anyways, um, 
when I was um, doing the work with her, I wanted to be able to use the whole ring. And like I said, initially, I could only work on the top edge because she was scared of him. And then I got so I could do a circle. And there's a lot of things you can do with horses. Um, people do now reverse round pen work where you have the horse go around the outside of a barrier instead of doing conventional lunging where you um, have the horse working on a circle around you. But a lot of circles can be hard on horses' joints, um, especially if they're not used to going on circles. And I really wanted to be able to use the whole arena. So what I did is I set out mats along the edge of the arena and I put her on a line and I would send her ahead of me at a walk at first to a mat and she would get there and I would um, click and treat her and then I would send her to the next mat. And I played with different spacing of the mats and I got her so I could send her at a trot to the mats. And so eventually got to the point where I could take her up and um, put her on the line and send her around the arena. And she would go, like she could go from, if you think the arena is a rectangle, I would have a mat halfway down the long side she would go from that mat all the way down around the short side, not cutting the corners, and come back up the other side and go to the mat on the other side. And in the beginning, I, I of course, had a mat in the middle of the short side, and I had some cones and stuff, but she learned to stay along the track. And I think the reason this is so reinforcing for me is it's become such a useful behavior because if I just need to get someone out and moving, either just because I haven't had time to ride or um, maybe like I used it a lot this spring when I had a horse that was slightly lame, I wanted to evaluate how well he was trotting and I would send him out. And instead of having him be on a circle, which um, changes the mechanics of how they move a little, and, and also most horses don't tend to make really round circles. I could send him down the long side and I could actually be standing far enough away that I could evaluate like how his gait was. Um, and I even used it when the vet came uh, last summer, the vet came to see Aurora and she was like, she was like, can you have her drop for me? And I'm like, sure, where, how far do you want her to go? Do you want her to go down to the end? And she looked at me like I was nuts. And I'm like, no, I'll just send her down the long side. And so we just stood at one end and I sent her off and she ran all the way down to the long side. And the vet was like, how did you do that? Because they're so used to people having to run with a horse or chase the horse or something. And for me, it was because she was trotting on her own, <clears throat> it was a lot easier to evaluate how she was moving because she was not being influenced by, you know, somebody either the speed of the person running or the person behind, you know, using a whip as might traditionally be done. But I, I have since taught this behavior to Madagascar and I love it because if I only have... Um, if I haven't ridden them for a little while or if I'm concerned about their soundness or if I just feel like they need to get out and move, I can go out and I can put the mats in different places around the ring and send them. And um, they seem to enjoy it. And I taught Aurora sort of a general cue, which is um, I just say turning. So if she's headed for a mat and I want her to make a circle. I mean, one of the problems with using mats is the horses, they have sort of a magnet effect. So the horses will get really intent on going to the mat. And if you decide... If you're headed towards a mat and you actually want to turn before you get to the mat, they'll be like, no, we're going to the mat because that's the behavior they know. But I wanted to be able to do big circles. So I taught her that if she came up and around the corner and she was headed for the mat, but I said turning, it meant we were going to turn before we got to the mat and make a big circle. And um, I didn't teach that formally. I just started saying turning and then I would walk towards the center and take the line with me a little bit. And then she learned that. And I actually still use that, like sometimes riding, if I'm riding and the horse is like really thinks we're going one place and I want to go someplace else, I say turning and they they realize that means we're not, we're not going in the direction, you know, straightforward that they think you have. So that's been a really reinforcing behavior for me because it's been so useful and because like they they seem to like it. They're happy to go off and trot and move around and and I think also there's a lot of um I think it's a really useful behavior on the you know social media and stuff. You always see people who have this dilemma which is they have a horse that is they want to use positive reinforcement. They have a horse that has some metabolic issue and either can't be ridden or is overweight and they need to somehow exercise it. And they're always in a bind because the conventional way of exercising a, a horse like that is to, to get on them and run them around or to make them go. And for me, this has just been a really nice way to get free forward movement without feeling like um, the horse is just running away because they think they have to. So um, so that's my that's been my favorite reinforcing behavior in the last couple of years. Um, I can see why that sounds like that would be super reinforcing. And um, I would love to see some video of that if you're able to yeah, capture I'm, it. I'm, I'm going to try and get it. The challenge is that because it uses the whole ring, 
I think mm-hmm. I need to, to recruit a camera person, which I usually film on a tripod. Um, and I, I mean, you would get the gist of it if I put it on a tripod. But And, and sometimes yeah. I do have to run a little bit to keep up with her. But I'm usually like, I'm sort of like running way behind just so that I can get, so that she doesn't hit the end of the line. The line is, is usually loose. And so I just want to make sure that I run fast enough that she doesn't hit the end of the line before she gets to her destination. Um, but yeah, this fall, if the weather is, um, it's been really dry here. We talked about that. Uh, but if the weather is better, I'll get some some video. And um, I mean, the other interesting thing about it is it really reveals, you know, when you ride a horse, even uh, if you think you're being pretty passive about it, horses will go places under saddle that they would not choose to go on their own. Meaning like I can ride um, her through the end of the arena, even on a day when she's a little worried about stuff that might be happening. Like every arena I've ever been in, houses has one end the horses don't like they it's either usually the end away from the barn or the end where there's some activity and they'll sort of go a little slow going towards that and then they'll accelerate coming the other way and when you're riding that can kind of not be as obvious because the horse is so used to going with you but when you put them out on the end of a line like that it reveals stuff so like i can get on i got on madagascar the other day and rode him around the outside of the arena and then the next day i got him and i put him on the line and it was really clear to me that there was something worrying him in the back. And so that was useful information. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll try and get some video. That makes me think of something that stuck out to me when you were talking about Aurora's bad year earlier. Um, yeah. And you were talking about how, but with the clicker training that you had done with her, you had all of these checkpoints kind of yeah. built in along the way. You know, um, this seems like another way to have some checkpoints to yeah, assess. No, I- I think it is. I think it is. And I think, you know, I mean, every day is different. So, you know, if your horse is sticky one day going in a certain direction, it could just be that, um, you know, the way the world works often seems to be this way, which is the far end of my arena also is the end closest to my neighbor's property where weird stuff happens. So not only is it farther away from the barn and their friends, but it's into probably what they consider more of a danger zone. So I, I, I think it's always worth monitoring to kind of go, how do they really feel about, are they comfortable? working down there. Um, And I like having things like that because otherwise it's easy to kind of, I mean, horses, you really can train horses to do things they're not comfortable doing. They they generally want to cooperate with you. And, And I think even with clicker training, you sometimes have to be even more careful about that because they'll really, they'll really make an effort for you. And so you have to have some way of, um, you know, stepping back every now and then and going, okay, let's make sure that there isn't something going on that I haven't noticed. And and having a variety of activities like that, I think makes it different activities show different things. So I try and mix things up a little bit. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing everything that you have shared with us today. Um, <laughs> Uh, from myself on behalf of ATA and everybody listening today as well. Thank you for spending time with us today and sharing all of this. No, it's been great. I mean, I haven't really shared Aurora's story. It's sort of, I actually had to go back and go through, I keep pretty detailed training notes on everything and I had to go back and pull out um, the relevant stuff. And there was stuff even I had forgotten, but maybe now that I've gone through the step of doing that, I'll write down some of it because I, I do think, you know, on one level, you could say, wow, it took you a year to get through that. On another level, it it does show that if you just keep picking away at it and trying to stay within the horse's comfort level and, you know, I changed things in the environment I thought would help. I changed things about my training I thought would help. I tried to teach her new skills I thought would help. You know, we got through it. So I think that's uh, that should be encouraging for somebody else who might be having maybe not exactly the same problem, but something similar. It should be encouraging. And I thank you for sharing that encouragement um, with us and sharing your ripples with us here today. We do, of course, appreciate all of you tuning in as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with the animals in our lives in the most positive, most fun, and most choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.atamember.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode, though. Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.